If you always wanted to make mead but thought it was just far too intimidating, you need far too much stuff, it's just far too complicated, well guess what? We're going to break that myth right now and show you a really easy way to make your very first mead. Alright, to make this mead, you're going to need a vessel. This vessel used to hold apple juice. That's right, you can find a one gallon glass fermentation vessel in your very own grocery store. We actually got it at Publix. We bought the fermenter and got a gallon of apple juice for free. You're also going to need honey. Today we're going to be using Ugh. orange blossom honey. But you can use wildflower honey, you can use clover honey, you can use pretty much any honey you can find at your grocery store. As long as it's really honey. Some of them are not so much. You want to make sure it's genuine honey. Raw, hun raw honey is a great way to go if it says raw or 100% pure if you're in the United States. That, I think, is the nomenclature that they use. You will also need a cup of black tea, the black tea of your choice. And please use black tea. Don't use green tea. Don't use ginger tea. Don't use sassafras tea. Don't use lavender tea. Don't use... Just use black tea. For this, just use black tea. There's a reason why I'm being so animated about that. I've been asked a million times, can I just use this? The reason you use tea in this recipe is not for flavor, okay? It is merely to add a little bit of mouthfeel and complexity to this brew. You want the black tea, that's what's going to give you the best at that. Just use it. Trust me. Also, some other, some other little things that you can add are, I like to add a little bit of a citrus flavor. Now, this is already a citrusy style honey, so it makes sense. You can use a swath of orange peel, lemon peel if you want to, lime peel if you really want to, but be careful, lime adds weird flavors to honey sometimes. I don't particularly care for it, but other people might. I am going to be using dried orange peel that we dried ourselves, so it's all good. It's just little tiny peelings of it and... We put it in teas and things like that. I'm going to be using some of it in our mead today. You're also going to need Fleischmann's active dry yeast. Don't have Fleischmann's? Have something else? Go ahead and give it a try. However, I will tell you, this particular bread yeast will give a more consistent result than most of the others on the market. And that is from hundreds, if not thousands, of pieces of input via our audience and from our own experience. Now, before anybody gets out there and says, oh, bread yeast can't make good mead. Okay, this is your first mead. I don't want you to have to go buy expensive stuff. Can you do better with wine yeast? Yes, it will probably be better in some ways. What's the downside to using bread yeast in a mead? Well, for one, it won't what we call flocculate as well. What that means is at the end of a fermentation, all the stuff falls out and goes to the bottom. It doesn't stack as neat when you use bread yeast. You, you'll get little wispies and things. Do they hurt you? No. Do they actually affect the flavor? No. In some ways, bread yeast can make a superior tasting product to wine yeast of a similar vintage. In some ways, bread yeast can make a superior tasting product to wine yeast of a similar vintage. We've done videos on that. There's proof, and we've tested it time and time again. A lot of people are going to hate me for that, and I will fight them. I will argue with them. Bread yeast makes a perfectly fine product. After all, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the same yeast all over the place, and that is what bread yeast, ale yeast, mead yeast, whatever you want to call it, it's all the same species of yeast. They're just bred to do slightly different things. Get it? What I did there? Bred to do different things. Ha -ha. Yeah. The final ingredient you will need is raisins. The most contentious of mead ingredients ever, if there was one. Now, there's some myth, there's some tradition, and just plain old, why not, in using raisins. First, I want to be clear, raisins are not truly a significant source of nutrition for yeast, okay? Yeast do need some nutrition aside from the honey itself. That said, they will actually happily produce alcohol the whole time. Just might not taste so great, might need more time to age, but it can be just as good. However, in winemaking, people use grapes, right? So the idea is that if grapes produce enough nutrition to make a wine, then dried grapes should be good for meat. Well, it's sort of true, but sort of not. You know, that's where some of the myth comes in. However, I am going to be using two ounces. You got to use a significant amount. This is not like five raisins thrown into a thing. This is about 50 or 100. It might have been like 150 raisins. I don't know. I didn't actually count the raisins. I counted the amount. Two ounces. Why did I use two ounces? Because four ounces looked like too much, but I really wanted to use four ounces because I thought it would be better. 
there is a little bit of nutrition in these guys. Not a lot. There's a little bit of sugar in these guys too, but what there also is is flavor and tannins. Now tannins are going to come from the tea as well. They are a different kind of tannins. This will add a little bit of complexity, a little bit of color, and a little bit of extra flavor to this mead. A richness and a depth that would be absent with their absence. So as much as this is a simple mead, there's a lot of complex things going on here. And I just want to make it clear that once you see how we do this, this is super easy. And before anybody says you talk too much, I would rather you understand what we're doing than just go throw this in, throw this in and you're done. No, I want you to understand it because if you want to get into this hobby, this is a great starting point. But I want you to understand what you're getting into and what you're actually doing and why. That way, when you do go further in this hobby, you actually understand a little bit better of what's going on. The final ingredient you will need is water. And the most important part of that water is that it's non-chlorinated. And it's off camera. It's over there. I'll get it when we need it. The table's getting kind of full, but it's water. Yes, as she said, you want non-chlorinated. We do use filtered tap water, which has all the chlorine and stuff removed. If you cannot find anything like that or your tap water tastes like, you know, a swimming pool, I would buy filtered water. Any filtered water is going to be fine. Try not to use distilled water that has all the minerals and nutrients removed from it. Probably not the best thing for making mead with. But anyway, let's get started. You'll also probably want a scale. They tend to be helpful. We are going to be doing things in mostly imperial units today simply because that's what we have and that's what most of our stuff is made of, so I'm very sorry. But first thing I want to do is try to jam all of those raisins into this bottle. So we're actually going to take that off the scale first. I just thought of that. Okay. I can change my mind. It can happen. All right. What we're going to do is put that funnel on there, though. One thing we forgot to mention is you might want a chopstick. And Brian did chop these raisins. Oh yeah, these are chopped up pretty fine. Because that's another thing. A lot of people say, oh, raisins don't work. Well, here's the thing. If the yeast can't really get to the nutrients inside them, then no, they're not going to. So I like to chop them up a bit. And you know what? If it doesn't make, it doesn't actually do anything, it makes me feel better. It increases their surface area and it makes them easier to get into here. Yep. Easier, not easy. This is probably the most frustrating and time-consuming portion of the entire making of this mead. If someone has a better way, please do it. I don't normally do it like this. In all honesty, I don't use raisins in a lot of my meads anymore because we do put other things in them. So we don't, we don't need the extras. We already have the flavorants, we already have the tannins. One thing we haven't really spoken about much is sanitation. And it's really important that you wash all of these things well and use something like a star sand or some kind of cleaner. If you really can't do that, boiling them just like you would for canning preservation will work just fine. All of our stuff has been sanitized in the red bucket of sanitization. including the funnel, the, the uh, fermenter, everything. This wasn't because, well, you know what? It was boiling. But these, which we're going to use to get a reading, an optional step, but one I highly recommend. If this is your very, very first made and you own none of the gear, don't bother about the, the hydrometer or anything like that yet. We'll get to that another time. At this point, the order of events is important for a couple of reasons. If I put the yeast in now and then poured hot tea on top of it, I could kill my yeast. If I pour water in now and then try putting honey in, honey will be stuck in my funnel. So it's very important to do things in this order. I'm gonna take this and put it on my scale, totally obfuscating my face. Then I'm going to put in my honey. Oh, look at that brand new bottle. And like we said, this is an orange blossom honey. You could use clover, you could use uh, wildflower, whatever you like. I wouldn't go with something like buckwheat or anything really heavy for my first mead. Those are harder flavors to work with. So you might not actually really like the end product. Best to use something a little more neutral, a little more generic. So I'm going to use three pounds of this honey, which is about 1.6 kilograms. Okay, three pounds of honey is in there. Now, many of you who are getting into this probably realize that the fermentables, the honey that you put in there, is what gauges how much alcohol you have. Well, your yeast does too. So do me a favor, please, for this one recipe, don't be tempted to put in more honey than what I suggested. I put in a lot of honey for the yeast that we're using. It's going to create about 12% alcohol. If you want to have more alcohol, drink two glasses. Honey is very thick, very sticky stuff. 
If you didn't heat the bottle ahead of time, like I didn't, you probably have a whole ton of honey up in this funnel, but it's been weighed. So it needs to get into your brew. An easy way, I'm gonna take this tea right here, and I'm just gonna hold the edge of the tea bag so it doesn't fall in, even though it wouldn't matter all that much. And this is still hot. It's been steeping for, oh, maybe 10 minutes, just as long as we've been talking through this video. And I'm just gonna drizzle it down the sides, rinsing it off, melting it down. That gets out most of it. At this point, I'm gonna try to jam some of these guys. If you have fresh lemon peel or orange peel or whatever you happen to be using, you could probably do this a lot easier. Probably using, if I was using fresh, it might be like, I don't know, a quarter of an orange, half an orange worth of peel. And some people will say it doesn't do anything. I think it adds just that little extra something that's difficult to determine, but if it wasn't there, you might miss it. We used about that much in another mead and it actually gave hints of orange months down the months down the line it was wonderful okay all right so now that we've got most everything in there the last thing is the water now if i put all the water in it'll be hard to mix this up so i'm going to put half the water in right now to about there i'll put my funnel in with the water for the moment because it's okay I have what I call my thumb saver bung. What this is, is a solid stopper. If you don't have one, it's okay. You can use the cap that, that came with this. You can, you know, whatever you got to do. You want to just put something in there so that it keeps it from coming out. And then you shake the bejesus out of it. What do I mean by shake the bejesus out of it? What I mean is get all that stuff mixed together. And as you're doing that, you're adding oxygen into that must, which is necessary for the yeast in the very beginning of fermentation. After a couple of weeks, you do not want to introduce more oxygen. A very simple rule of thumb for shaking in honey into mead. If you think you're done, shake for two more minutes. Okay, now, as you look at this, does it look like it did before? No, you are seeing a lighter color due to oxygenation. A lot of oxygen got into there. That's a good thing, we want that. Now, what I'm gonna do, add more water. Be careful how much water you put in because you don't want to fill it all the way up into the neck. Some expansion and some foam will happen from fermentation. Don't get too greedy. Go to about here-ish or so. Just at the shoulder is good for me. Okay, the liquid is to about the shoulder. What I would like to do now though is you have an option. You can put the yeast in right now and then take a reading or take a reading then put in the yeast. Either way, it doesn't matter because we're using the yeast straight away. We're just putting it right in. Today, just because of all the foam and everything going on, I think I'm gonna do it right out of the bottle. I'm gonna do it now. Now, when I say take a reading, this is that optional step. Why do we do readings? Mostly to know how much alcohol we're gonna get, where it is, how, what, are, what is the gravity? It's a density of sugars to water. What, what gravity means, uh, it's way too much for this video. We actually have another video explaining that, but it talks about, how to know how much fermentation has occurred. And at the end of fermentation, that reading is actually more important because that'll tell you, is your, is your meat done? Is it stuck? Is it dry? Is it sweet? It gives you an idea in a numerical value of what sweetness level you have or what dryness level. What do I use for readings? A turkey baster, also known as a poor man's wine thief. Nothing wrong with this. This does the same job as those really expensive stainless and glass ones for like, uh, I don't know, pennies on the dollar. A hydrometer which is made for doing this exact thing. It's a triple scale. Do not get confused with an alcohol meter. Some people have done that. It's not the right thing. And I'm just using a plain old graduated cylinder. All in all, the equipment that we have here could be bought for 30 bucks. I mean, it's not that expensive. And hey, you get a gallon of free apple juice. That can be made into cider. One thing that's important, once you add more water in, make sure you shake it up again, just to make sure that it's completely homogenous throughout. Um, on our reading, I got a 1.110 original gravity. Now, what does that really mean? Well, each pound of honey that you add into a gallon of must is about 0.035 specific gravity. If you do not understand the specific gravity scale at all, we do have videos on that. It's far too much for me to go into this video here because this is supposed to be simple. Some people will tell you, don't do this. I'm going to disagree with those people. 
because everything that we did here has been sanitized. Everything is clean. There's absolutely no reason to waste that little bit of must. Just no reason at all. Now we move on to the most contentious portion of this video. A lot of people tell, will tell you that you cannot use bread yeast. And that comes from, there's a whole elitism in mead making and in brewing in general, and I don't agree with it. And it makes me a little bit of an outlier, but you know what? I don't care. I've made a lot of good mead, a lot of great wines, and a lot of ciders and beers with bread yeast. This exact one, Fleischmann's. I think a lot of the myth comes from there are some bread yeast that are not good to brew with. I don't actually know what they are, but I know that some of the Red Star ones can be anywhere from 3% to 15 or 16%, depending on the brew, depending on the batch of product that you got. But our rule when we're coming up with this recipe was things that you can find in your grocery store. We know right. you can get bread yeast in your grocery store, where wine yeast you probably cannot. Right. And I use this one because it's the one that was in my grocery store. I use it for baking bread, and I started out all my brewing with it. Works just fine. We're going to use a teaspoon today. And the exact amount isn't critical. Don't get crazy if you use a little bit over, a little bit under. I'm just going to dump it right in. Now we used a dry funnel because this It'll is a big stick. sticky wet mess right now and that way our yeast just went boop right in. And I'm just going to give this a swirl. I used to hydrate yeast all the time which means to put it in water and let it bloom. I don't do that anymore because I don't feel that it's necessary and manufacturers of the yeast have said we've kind of already done that for you. Not necessary. At this point you now have what is called a must for mead. Okay. There's nothing else that you need to add to this. There's nothing else you really need to do it except put some sort of a cap on there. Now, if you do not have a bung in an airlock and don't want to buy one yet, you can just use the cap that came with this. And here's what you do. We have actually thrown that cap away because we don't use them. But here is what you do. You put it on tight, loosen it just a little bit until it'll rattle ever so slightly on that. That will allow gases to escape. If you put it on too tight, it will blow up. I am not even kidding. It will blow up. Flying glass, not a good thing. Never mind the sticky mess that you have to clean up afterwards. If you put it on too loose, it is possible that bugs could get in. So find that happy medium where it's just slightly, slightly movable. You should be fine, okay? If you really get nervous about it every day, just give it a little loosen and put it back. You should be just fine. If you are willing to spend a couple of bucks for this upgrade that we're going to show you next, then by all means do so. By the way, I highly recommend this upgrade. Okay, that upgrade is this. It is a rubber stopper with an airlock. Altogether, a few dollars at a brew store or through Amazon. We do have links below for some of this stuff if you feel enterprising and want to try it out. To use it, very simple. Stick it in there. <laughs> and that's it. We you also fill put it, yeah, to its halfway mark, there's a little indicator there with sanitization liquid. You don't want to use just water and you don't want to use rubbing alcohol. Please do not do that. Yeah. If you don't have sanitization liquid, then you can just use a neutral spirit like vodka. If you have a particular scotch that you just don't like, <laughs> that's what I do. Okay, what to do with this next? This is going to go sit somewhere in a room temperature you know, between 65 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the Celsius will be here because I just don't know it off the top of my head. Relatively dark place. Like, you don't want to put it in a windowsill. You don't want light on it all the time. Even on, even natural light or even artificial light, not the best for it. Will it hurt it directly? Probably not. But you know what? Better safe than sorry. A bathtub is a great place to keep it. You don't want it too cold. You don't want it too hot either. That will alter the way the fermentation takes place and change the characteristics of what the yeast will give in flavor. That's important. We don't make this just to make alcohol. We make this to taste good. So give it everything that you can. Make it as easy as possible. Being that this is your first meat, I know you don't have all this extra stuff and you've never done this and this is a scary thing and it's okay because this is done now. It just has to sit for a few weeks. When I say a few weeks, give it a month. Five weeks, six weeks, there's absolutely no harm for sitting longer. However, if you try drinking this in two weeks, you just might end up with a little bit of bloat and gas and other uncomfortable issues. Digestional however, distress. Yeah. However, it's not actually dangerous. Okay. So, what to expect? While it's fermenting, you will see this foam go up. It might stick to the top here. It might get all brown and crusty. You will see bubbles coming up the sides. If you... If you don't see any of that in the first four days, add more yeast. 
a different yeast probably because the yeast you used was probably dead because you haven't made bread in about a year and a half and it's still sitting in your fridge. You will, if you used an airlock, you will see activity in here. And that's a sign that fermentation is starting to occur. It should be the side closest to this tube should be low and the side furthest away should be high because the water is pushing through, kind of like an S trap in your sink. Um, other things to look for. If you see very oddly colored things, which is highly unlikely, green, blue things Black. with hair, throw it away. Yeah. Just dump it all out, boil everything, <laughs> bleach everything if you have to. <laughs> That's bad. In all my years of brewing, I've never seen it, so don't even really worry. I just wanted to get that little safety reminder out there for you. If you see white little blobs or off-white little blobs on the top, it's probably just yeast rafts, which is normal and common and nothing to worry about. What you want to do if you do see that, to know if it's yeast rafts or mold, give it a shake. Don't take the airlock out. Just shake it all up real good. And if they go away and don't come back, it was yeast rafts. If it comes back, it could be mold, but it could also be yeast rafts. Okay, so that is the basics of this, and that would lead us on to the next step. Okay, so we're 15 days in. We have activity in our airlock. We have little bubbles coming up. We have our uh, orange peel and raisins. raisins are floating on the top. And we have some stuff on the bottom. All of these things are completely normal and expected. All right, so as you can see, here's the airlock. It's going, you know, we don't really count the seconds or anything like that but it is moving. You can certainly see that something's something is happening. All right, so here's the side view where you can see the floating raisins, the orange peel, and some of those bubbles across the top. This one's not super, super active, but I can still see tiny bubbles coming up, which tells me it's still working. And now as we move towards the bottom, you can see all that lease buildup in the bottom there. That's really important. That's the, uh, the yeast falling out of suspension, things like that, various proteins and things falling out of the meat. So what have we done so far? Not a whole lot, but Brian is going to show you what he has been done. And that's the only thing that we've done other than add this rubber band. Sometimes the bungs don't want to stay in these repurposed jars yep. and you need a little extra help. So we just Basically looped... we have this bung that's just a half a size too big. Yeah. So we just looped a rubber band around it and looped it onto this handle so it keeps the pressure so it won't pop out. Now, some things to watch for since this is your first time making meat. If you see brown bubbling and stuff that came up and it left uh, what's called a croissant, left a mark across the bottle, perfectly normal, perfectly fine, don't even worry about it. What that is, is is the foaming process of an active fermentation. The little foam bits have dried, uh, have dried along the inside of the glass and left that line. That's, That's perfectly that normal. Your, your fruit, your, your raisins and your oranges will float. No worries. If you see a little bit of white specks here and there, it's probably yeast rafts, not mold. Don't worry. The next step will actually get rid of that. Along the bottom, you're going to see various stuff. You'll see some of your raisins. You'll see some powdery stuff, some film, some all kinds of stuff. That's perfectly normal. Nothing to worry about at all. If you can, if you cannot see through it and it's very murky, that is really normal at this stage. Okay. What I'm going to do next is what I call the swirl method. Okay. Really, really simple. I leave the airlock on, pick it up, put a hand on the bottom and swirl it. When you do this, it's going to degas. So a lot of gas is going to come out that airlock. Sometimes it'll want to overflow. So I usually do a little bit and stop then a little bit then stop because it's producing a lot of CO2 in here. Now, remember those little yeast raft things that I was talking about? If it was mold, which I doubt it, if you're in an active fermentation, very highly unlikely mold needs oxygen. There's no oxygen in here. So if it's yeast rafts, they'll mix in and disappear. If it was mold, it'll come right back in a couple of days. So that's something you can watch out for. If it keeps coming back, it could be mold. And if it's not white, like if it's brown and green and blue, yeah, you probably want to dump that. But I just give it a swirl. And what I'm trying to do is get all this stuff at the bottom active, okay? The side effect is it degasses, even though that's important too. Degassing takes all their waste away so the yeast can get back to work, makes it a little easier for them, okay? But moving all that sediment around is a really good idea because it just, if there was some dormant yeast that was maybe stuck behind other proteins and things and it couldn't get to stuff, now you just reactivated everything, letting it go even further. 
Another good reason why to do the swirl is in this particular brew, we have some solids, the raisins and the lemon peel. And because they have floated to the top, swirling keeps all of that stuff moist and wet. So bad things probably won't happen. Right. But just so you're aware, bad things probably won't happen anyway, because most of the bad things need an oxygen environment. This is a non-oxygenated environment. It's all CO2. All that gas is being forced out. CO2 is heavier than oxygen, so the oxygen gets forced out if there was any. CO2 is filling this, making it the perfect environment for our yeast and a much less than perfect environment for all the stuff that might want to drink this. So what happens next? Oh, I'm going to put this back down on the floor. It's going to ferment for another couple of weeks, and you'll see an update. As always, guys, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye.